Hey everyone, what is up? I am Charlie Shrem and you are listening and watching Untold Stories where twice a week you and I get to dive deep into that rabbit hole with some of crypto's most influential leaders to find out where we came from, how we got here, and where we're going, and how this movement truly came to be. I'm so excited to be here. This is a long time coming. This is a second episode where we're talking about Casper Labs, CBC Casper, and that whole consensus algorithm. I'm really excited to be joined today by Cliff Sarkin and Meta Parlakar. Thank you guys so much for, for coming on the show today. Thanks for having us, Charlie. Thanks for having us. So like, what's, what's amazing is that this is probably one of the longest running R&D projects that not only has been conceptualized since the early days of, of Bitcoin and Ethereum, but Casper Labs was founded, I think, in, you said, we were talking earlier, October, October 31st, 2018, which is a nod to Satoshi. And, and I probably got involved in an advisory capacity sometime in late 2018. And I know pretty much every, everyone in, all of my friends and everyone in the crypto space has gotten involved in this, are in this project at some point in the last two and a half years. How does it feel to finally, finally having everything come to fruition in the next like 30 to 60 days? Cliff, you want to take that <laughs> one? Take a deep breath. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Yeah, and, well, well, we're 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 not here that we're not there yet, and we have you know like you know fifteen twenty ish days until both mainnet launch mainnet launch and our first token sale, and that feels like it's going to take a year. So so we're not there yet, um. But yeah, um, you know, I'll let Meta go next because she was there at the absolute inception. I kind of came on board a few months later. But it is, it feels terrific, man. This, this two and a half years um, has been filled with incredible um, successes and, and lots of ups and downs. And, and it's crypto, right? Blockchain. So two and a half years feels like two and a half decades. Um, but it, it does feel really great to be launching into this market, to have this much excitement and this much support. Um, yeah, I, I kind of pinch myself waking up every day that, that we are where we it's are. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, so like when Renal, so Renal Scott and I met in, geez, it was October, October 21st, uh, 2018, when we sat down and Renal, I mean, uh, Renal and Scott met with me. And Scott says, okay, it just came from uh, Brock's place. And Brock's in, like, let's go do this. And uh, Renal's like, Meta, let's go do this, let's go build this great company. Let's, you know, we believe in the CBC Casper protocol. We know that you can get it done, bring the engineers and let's make it happen. And it's, it's been a really long journey. Like I, I see some of the other protocols in the space and they, they know they, they do a lot of the research work and they know what protocol they want to go with. And they just, it's like a straight shot. And for us, it was a long time. And, and one of the reasons it took us such a long time to build this thing is because the protocol wasn't complete. Like we embarked mm. on founding the company and to build out this protocol, but the CBC Casper research that Ethereum put out was only half of a consensus protocol. It was still theorized. It was still being theorized yeah. with, with Vlad and with Vitalik. And, 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 and I'm going to take this moment to give the, the listeners a little bit of an introduction about you guys, what you're doing and why this is so important. But let's go back to, to 2000 and. I don't know, 13 or 14, maybe when, when Vitalik's really started investigating, he wasn't happy with proof of work with, with the finality of proof of work that required confirmations. And there was an, a big energy component that, that, uh, was talked about in the early days that was seen as like a negative. Uh, and that has been talked about and debunked a lot over the years, but there was, there still is a lot of energy use usage of proof of work. So there was an, a lot of the early to give the listeners like a little bit of a brief history, a lot of the early minds, and if you look at the early conversations that we were having back in those years, a lot of it was investigating the work of Satoshi and to further that work and to say, how can we do this without confirmations? How can we do this by consensus? How can we do this where it's a two of three, not a hundred percent? How can we have situations where miners or signature validators get penalized? Slat, all these different concepts and game theory, socioeconomic, that was being investigated and studied. 
And to trace back, and I know you guys will give the history, but to trace back the the early days of 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 CBC Casper was really when with one of the architects of Ethereum and, and the architect of of of, of CBC Casper uh, of Vlad Zamfir, he was actually, uh, and I still am not convinced that proof of stake was the future at a time when Vitalik and some others were saying everyone needs to move away from proof of work onto proof of stake. And so CBC Casper came about during Vlad's own personal exploration of how do I make proof of stake work? And that's kind of like why I fell in love with it because I'm on that same kind of journey. And I'd like to hear your both like personal histories of that journey too. But just to give a little bit of a background, Cliff, you are a tech entrepreneur and a licensed attorney, and which is which is great, by the way. Yeah, don't, don't say that too loud. But okay, yeah. no, no. Well, before <laughs> before I just you uh, in tw- you were uh, VP of Business Development at DNA, a leading early stage blockchain venture fund, and prior to crypto, you helped scale a lot of successful companies like Duda, from twelve companies to seventy plus. You were involved in video surfs, eighty million dollar acquisition, and you went to UC Berkeley. Oh, and you got a JD from Harvard Law too. So you got since when? When did crypto start like attracting like talent like this? And Meta. Oh man, you for the. This is when I was doing my research. It said for the past two decades, but I don't think, but I don't think you've been working for like two decades. But you've been involved in some of my favorite products like MP3.com and Divix. Yeah. And you both yeah. know how to build out protocols and companies in conjunction with with each other which is which is really really wonderful so, so Tra- charlie if, if i can interject for a second sure. like because i think crypto and blockchain has always attracted great talent you know i might have some degrees after my name and i did really well on standardized tests but you don't need that to build cool shit and to break shit like we've been doing that from the beginning um and our industry is led by some of the smartest humans on the planet right mathematicians and and for, going back to the cypherpunks um that, that might not have been to Ivy League schools, but that doesn't mean they're not brilliant. So we all came to the space sure. from different backgrounds and are contributing in our own ways. And I'm just glad I my last startup failed at just the right time, you know, in early 2017, where everyone I spoke to was talking about Bitcoin and blockchain, and I slipped in the rabbit hole then. So I'm just I'm just fortunate that that happened. So let's that's uh, that's. That's an amazing thing to say, and I don't say that enough. In fact, a lot of people don't realize that some of the, I'll give one example, the CEO, it's not Coinbase, but the CEO of another company that is in the process of going public, a huge Bitcoin company that we all use, was homeless before and used to go and get paid by Bitcoin conferences and given free tickets and he would just, that was his job. He would get given, they, we would give him free tickets and he would just come to the conferences and he would get his flights paid for if he would write articles. And that's how he would, he would make some money. And because he was there, he said, I have this great idea. And here he is like seven years later. So that's like, amazing. you don't, yeah, you don't need to go to college or anything like that. You do not. No, absolutely not. Probably like all university teachers are like, shut up. Don't tell them that, you know. <laughs> Okay, well, it's so- definitely not a requirement when we're hiring engineers. <clears throat> like we don't necessarily look at, you know, the the school they went to or the pedigrees that they have, right? It's just about what you can do in terms of when you're talking to your interviewer, what your coding chops are and, you know, what your code looks like. So what are you looking at, take- GitHubs? We do look at GitHubs. We do a couple of interviews. You know, we they interview with core members, members of the core team. And yeah, through the interview screening process, we can suss out, you know, their their technical aptitude. Yeah. This is a great kind of like jumping in point. So when you look at engineers, not just working for Casper Labs, but but all the companies in our space, do you look for not just their like development ability, but their meant their their like where they are on their personal journeys or like what they what their beliefs are in in crypto as a whole? Do you like look at that and ask those questions? Is that something that's I think because I so yeah I mean you yeah so what we're talking about here is you know interviewing for culture and fit right yeah, so sure I'm, that's the I'm word. really I'm super proud of the culture the engineering culture that we built um here at Casper right the team of course is overwhelmingly developers so Renal and Cliff have been amazing in saying you know what product first and then we'll worry about the business later so we have always considered ourselves a technology first company 
And so for a very, very long time, even today, over two thirds of the company are engineers, you know, two thirds to three quarters of the you know, company is engineers. Um, so the culture we have in engineering really is a, a strong cornerstone of the culture of the company overall. And what's, what's really important to me is this notion of, you know, personal accountability and personal responsibility. So we keep, you know, our, our management overhead and the number of meetings we have is very, very thin. The team is rem completely remote and distributed. And so we look for what I like to call it entrepreneur de entrepreneurial developer. And this is somebody that mm -hmm. says, hey, I want you to throw a problem at me and tell me to go solve it. Um, and so that's, that's the kind of team that we've built. We've, we've built a team that doesn't want necessarily the map laid out for them or the path laid out for them. They want to be able to cut their own path, solve those technical challenges and find like the North Star, whichever the, what is the feature or the problem that they're trying to solve. And that's worked extremely well for us uh, in terms of a culture, right? Like we don't necessarily need formal business analysis. Any one of the engineers on the team can write their own specifications and requirements given a business problem. And we try to attack, you know, the project and the problems that we're solving in the space. We look at it very much from a business problem. And then the developers and, you know, the engineers take the problem and they run with it with a solution. That's the ethos of the company. That's, yes. that's where the company got started because there was a problem that the solution needed to be figured out. So what was that problem? Yeah. So, you know, when we initially founded the company, we saw two, we had two big ideas we wanted. One, we believed in the CBC Casper protocol and that a blockchain could be founded and built using that protocol as its primary consensus protocol. The second thing was, is that Renal and I both believed that we could build a fantastic professional services company around this technology. And we felt that that was really lacking in the space for enterprise companies. They need help onboarding this technology, not unlike the early days of cloud and web two internet technologies, right? Enterprise, um, you know, blockchain is hard to understand. It's complicated and um, it's not clear what piece of your application is a good uh, candidate for blockchain technology and how you're gonna leverage it. Even if you think about, well, I wanna tokenize something that's ephemeral today, what is the incentive mechanism design around that tokenization? And companies don't really know where to start, right? So Renal and I had this vision of building a fantastic professional services company around the open source software. And that remains a very strong cornerstone of what we're building today. We pivoted into, well, we didn't pivot in, but we evolved into the public blockchain for enterprise business model. Because when I sat down and looked at the competitive landscape of, of blockchains in the space, it became really clear to me that I would never select any of the existing public blockchains as a protocol that I would build my business on. Why? And Why not? Because there lacks, completely lacks comprehensive code governance tooling on any of those blockchains, right? So like I work, my background is uh, senior directors of engineering for very large, you know, multi-million dollar companies. And I had a certain set of things that I had to be able to do when I was managing enterprise product, right? One, it had to stay up. Two, I had to service customers. Three, I had to add new features. And I had to do this with some regular cadence, right? Like if I took me more than four weeks to fix a bug, I started hearing from, you know, from strategic customers. So it just, it, immutability of the code simply was not an option, right? Um, and there were very, you know, stringent governance protocols internally in these large companies, right? You had to go through a go no go process. Every feature had to be vetted, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you map that back to like what some of the DeFi protocols need in terms of this governance thing we talk about in blockchain, software has always been governed, right? It just wasn't visible. But all of these large enterprise firms, they have very long governance processes whenever you push out a large update, right? Some of these changes are even strategic board level decisions around what they're going to do with their product. What is it and called? So FOSS, where the, the mechanism for, for like managing large open source development projects that are decentralized pre Bitcoin, like, like there are govern, there's a governance system for that. There is, there is absolutely. And internally in all of these companies, you absolutely have software governance, right? You have like multiple quality gate checks that you need to go through, right? I have been a senior director of quality assurance in many of these companies. I would be the one that would, they would, I would walk into the door that like, we have a problem shipping our software. We have quality problems shipping our software. We have configuration management problems shipping our software. 
So what we baked in to the cast. That's protocol, what my CTO said to me every time when I was the COO of Jax. We yeah. were like, push the update. Now we have a problem delivering the software. Sorry. Sorry for interrupting. No, you're exactly right. That's funny. And so what we built into the Casper protocol is it's the hard. ability to do these things. Like literally, and it all happens at layer one, right? Um, smart contracts in Casper can actually go through an automated build, release, deployment process. And software isn't tested by people in enterprise. Software is tested by computers, right? There isn't any way for you to scale out your software delivery unless you use technology, computers to do it. And Casper contracts will drop directly into existing pipelines. And this is like a huge, huge deal. Um, and we discovered it internally in our own team that like we can't deliver contracts without having this capability. So we built it for ourselves and now we're making it available to everybody that uses the protocol. I love it. I love it. This March, lose the lucky charms and crash into crazy boosts with my favorite sponsor, Bit Casino. I love these guys. Every month, Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, they're just coming out with the best, craziest incentives. All you have to do is go to bitcasino.io forward slash Charlie. And the St. Patrick's Day casino boost is so cool because when you play these slot machines, these boosts can last anywhere from one minute to 10 minutes, and they can be up to 33% bonus from whatever you're winning or playing. It's so cool. You have to go to bitcasino.io forward slash Charlie. When you celebrate St. Patrick's Day with them, they will definitely incentivize you and they set the standard. They really do set the standard for fun, fast, and fair gameplay using blockchain technology. You can deposit, wager, and withdraw in Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Tron, and much more. These guys, these guys have supported Untold Stories for such a long time. Give them a shout, bitcasino.io forward slash Charlie, and get your St. Patrick's boost on. They didn't write that. I wrote that shit. Hey guys, it's Charlie, and remember that time we interviewed Anthony Trenchev from Nexo Finance? Well, they are on a roll right now offering 5.9% APR on your crypto credit. You'll be able to borrow at less than 6% on some of your crypto. They got a savings account that's offering 12% interest a year, and now they have an integrated exchange so you can trade between all your cryptos without ever leaving their integrated wallet. It's so amazing. Make sure you check it out at Nexo.io and start earning interest, start managing your assets, because crypto banking just got real with Nexo. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> I love Nexo. It's such a great company. Just the way like smart contracts are audited now, it's like you have to get a developer to write the contract and you get like an SOL file and you deliver it to the auditor company. And then how do you trust that the one that's being delivered is the one you wrote and then that one is the one you uploaded? There's all these breaks. It's like it's like handling like a crime scene. If there's no what's the word like can can uh, I'm like like. There's a, the ch chain. a chain of custody, chain right? Of for, the, custody. For, the, for the code, yeah. There's the code a chain of, of custody for the right, code. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. So when I looked at this, I was, I just kind of, you know, scratched my head. And, and, and you know, you hear about Truffle and Ganache for the Ethereum ecosystem, but Truffle and Ganache will not integrate into what we call development operations pipelines, right? So there's an entire world of what we call DevOps, right? Development operations. And this is something that I have worked with since literally 1999. Like in 1999, when I worked at mp3.com, we had a massive DevOps pipeline and we were shipping almost 30 projects, 30 full blown projects, like single sign on and massively huge projects that we had like, you know, back then we had over a quarter million hits a day, right? And we had web 2.0 dynamic web pages and wow. analytics and all this stuff that was powering the system on the back end with continuous integration, continuous deployment. So for me, I'm like, how else do you deliver software? Like there isn't any other way. And so we bake that in, right? And so any CI CD pipeline will work with Casper contracts and you can build out a full integration test suite. So you could prove to your auditors, if you're concerned about how this particular variable is modified or mutated, you can prove that with unit tests. And from my perspective, like as far as I know, we're the only ones that provide this. And this is massively resonating with enterprise, right? They're like, yes, 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 yes. This is what we need, right? With blockchain. So in like those old movies, when they're testing a vaccine and you see the room and then there's like thousands of different of the same product that they're just tweaking a little bit, but they have to test it, test, 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 test to see which one works. And it, I forget it was like a movie that 
ants were killing all humans and they ended up chocolate was the cure to kill all the whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. With you're saying that on chain, on layer one, you have the ability to test and do QA and do QA uh, of a contract and have all of its variables be tested and everything like that. So you could have like in that similar situation, the perfect one come come to be. That's right. And so the test, so we provide the VM. So why did we build our own VM? We're not using the EVM, right? So part of the heavy lift that we did is we built our own execution engine. Um, What's a VM? A assembly. virtual machine, right? Yep. So this is yep. built like the testing computer built into the blockchain itself. This is not, this is something that Ethereum pioneered. Bitcoin didn't really have that. Uh, well, it doesn't have that at all, actually. No Turing complete software. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it is a Turing complete virtual machine. And more than putting the testing framework into the VM, what we do is we ship the VM as a separate module that can run inside an IDE, what we call an integrated development environment. So when you write code, when anybody writes software, and this is the way software has been constructed for 40 years, you have what's called an integrated development environment. And an example is like IntelliJ, right? IntelliJ is used for Java development, used for C++, it's used for C, it's used for Rust. And um, even if you're writing JavaScript code, Node.js code, whatever you use, what they call an IDE. So our virtual machine runs within the IDE. So you can run your contract. You don't need a node. You do not need a full node to run your contract. You can run your contract right there on your desktop inside an IDE. You can run your tests inside the IDE. You can set up this, the starting state of the blockchain within your IDE. Traditionally, and now you have to do that. You have to actually deploy your contract to test it in real time. And it costs gas and time and yeah, and energy. none of that's required. Like all the the entire iterative process of assembling your contract, and this is the way developers work today, is with an IDE, right? You you get your IDE. It has all of your syntax highlighting. It allows you to run your code, right? So Java compile. It's more like the Java in development environment. So you get the Java runtime environment and the Java software development kit. With Casper, you get the Casper runtime environment and the Casper software development kit. It's the exact same thing. So you can build your contracts, iterate over them, build out your full tests. And then when you're completely ready, then you can deploy to a test net and then simulate the transactions in the blockchain. But there's absolutely no requirement for you to deploy a full node in order to write contracts. We have a lot that we need to unpack here. Let's go back to the actual consensus algorithm here and talk about how when we're talking about finality, in this approach, you can have different like leveling or you can have different types of finality or you can have getting to a certain, instead of being zero or one or black and white, you can have it be more subjective and more variance. But can you, can we go back and, and, and really explain to the listeners why this consensus algorithm really convinced Vlad that proof of stake could be something that's viable in the long term? Well, so, you know, Vlad was chartered to come up with an alternative uh, consensus protocol for Ethereum that didn't use proof of work, right? And so one of the, there was a couple of reasons that he felt really strongly about CBC Casper. Namely, he was really thinking about the user experience, right? He wanted to provide users the flexibility to decide how much finality they needed, right? And, and a consistent, um, consistent user experience. So, you know, in, in the work that I did, I worked with Vlad for about two years while we were, you know, actively developing, uh, you know, this, the highway protocol. This is our flavor of CBC Casper. This is what we're building the blockchain with. And uh, a lot of his uh, thinking around consensus was, one, um, you needed to punish bad actors. That was really, really important, right? In proof of work right now, there really isn't that much of a punishment for a bad actor, right? They, they could, they have to waste a little bit of energy, right? But nobody comes in and takes your mining rig, right? Like it's the, the slashing in proof of work really isn't that punitive, right? Mm. Um, so he believed pretty strongly that if you uh, equivocate and you try to revert a decision, that there should be some kind of penalty. The second thing he believed in is that he actually believed that the validator set size, you know, should grow over time. It should be able to flex, be flexible so that users could have a consistent time to finalization, right? So if you think over time, as silicon catches up, because I believe silicon is going to be a huge factor in performance ultimately, right? As the last mile in bandwidth improves, so will the overall performance of all layer one protocols, sure. right? 
So as silicon gets better, you should be able to increase your validator set size, right? You should be able to provide more and more trust because messages are able to be transmitted a lot faster. And so the user experience can stay consistent over time, but you can take advantage of this underlying improvement in silicon by providing more trust, right? And so that was something he also wanted to see in the protocol. And then users should be able to pick their own finality, right? They should be able to say, well, if I'm just buying a cup of coffee, I don't need six confirmations. I don't need mm. to wait 90 minutes, right? I can, I can be perfectly satisfied that the protocol is going to finalize my transaction the minute it's included in a block, right? The minute the first validator says, yep, I see your transaction, yeah. I processed it, I'm good to go, right? Um, I don't need the same kind of finality that is if I'm buying a house, right? If I'm, if I'm putting something very valuable on the blockchain, I'm going to want to hear from a lot more validators before I'm ready to proceed. He wanted right? that to was create really a the- dynamic variable blockchain, some, where, it's, where every variable is dynamic instead of static, essentially, exactly. right? Yes, okay. yes, exactly. And the highway protocol actually does meet all of these requirements. Um, the validator set size will flow. Um, it can expand and contract. And now right now it is a configuration in the chain specification, but it, we have built that in such that the validator set can grow over time. Um, the fault, fault to- we call the fault tolerance threshold. Users can decide how many finality signatures they want to wait for and what the total stake is that's voted on a given block. They absolutely can decide. That is their choice. Um, so we have built all of these requirements into the highway protocols. I'm very proud of it. It's also a partially synchronous protocol, which means it's not it, like validators can send messages at their own tempo, right? Depending on, they don't have to participate in every single, voting on every single block. So it's not strictly synchronous that way. Cliff, from a business perspective, what type of of supply chains or companies or uh, would be the first adopters for for a variable-based blockchain like this that would look at Bitcoin and say, this doesn't work for us, or even Ethereum and say, this doesn't work for us. We need to be able to have more control. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the classic... No, no you know, blockchain uh, value proposition is, is, you know, works, which is this particular part of your tech stack, putting it on chain is going to make it cheaper and more secure, right? Not if faster really isn't, you know, if, if you want speed, obviously a centralized database is the way to go. But, but we're using the classic blockchain uh, uh, value proposition. And, you know, people love the... Um, the, the security of Ethereum and the trust that you get with a fully decentralized network, but the scalability, the, the network latency and the cost is, is really what's preventing them from really putting enterprise on, on Ethereum. And resources, right? Like a place to go to with questions and, and comp and, and corporate like enterprise level, uh, uh, yeah, consultation and, and, like and what you, you guys uh, would provide to these meta alluded like, to this and well, yeah, call. I don't know if, if it's genius because it's really kind of simple but the way we structured from from a corporate structure point of view the the company and its relation to the blockchain enterprises love so basically we started casper labs which is a for-profit corporation and then we raised equity people own shares in it and then for this period of our lifetime the period you're talking about the first two and a half years the main purpose has been to build the blockchain. Then we send it off to college, right? At, it, at the end of this month, and she's out there doing what she does. And we can maybe call her and check in and, and do some things, but she's going to do what she's going to do is belongs to the world. And then what Casper Labs becomes is this professional services shop where you know anyone can build on the blockchain like any other open source software. But if you had the resources to hire someone to assist you, a big enterprise or a government or an NGO, who else would you rather work with than the guys and gals that, that built the blockchain? And that's, and that's really resonating. And so to get to your, your question about what are the use cases, we're finding people actually come into us in all different industries. You, know, you mentioned supply chain. That's a classic blockchain use case. We're working with a, a few right now on really early stage, but idea formulation. Um, uh, licensing, provenance, uh, real like governments actually we're starting to work with. Um, I know like this is perfect for Estonia too, because their whole, people don't realize that you look at Estonia, their whole government is on, is on, is online. Like everything, like you go to 
Estonia.gov and you type in your ID number, you do from everything to your parking tickets, to your voting, to your taxes, to your uh, uh, every interaction you have with civil, criminal, or just everything, like even your interactions with your, it's all done. So if you look at, if they put this all like in the simplest of terms, put it on a blockchain, when you have like a static chain like Bitcoin is, it doesn't work for that. You need, in some respects, you need speed over objective finality because then there's no point of even having to do that contract, whatever you're trying to do. All It doesn't no point to it if it's slow. Like there are some, sometimes you, it's okay to bring yeah, that lever down again, for the lever to go speed is up. sometimes it, but really it's security. Um, you know, like if it's, if it's sensitive data, right? Like, and you don't want to house it locally and, and have it susceptible to single points of failure. You know, that, that, that's a big one. And cost. Um, if you're, if we're able to put on a network where you don't really have to pay for it because all the validators are getting compensated in tokens, then you as the customer, the government is like, heck yeah, it's cheaper and more secure. Let's, let's at least experiment with it. I mean, what we're finding when we talk with folks, what's really resonating them is this concept of mutable contract code, versioned and mutable contract code combined with immutable history log, right? So. And, and and when you want to it's leverage crazy to blockchain think about as a for a second. Yeah, if, because what, what happens is, is you want you want an immutable receipt of what happened in the past. That's what we really worry about is with tampering with history, right? Mm. I mean, I understand that everybody understands that software goes through revisions, things change, things get updated. You always are signing new terms of service. So you know that whomever you're working with, they've 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 kind of moved the needle in terms of terms of service. But I want to know what something happened back then, and I don't want somebody mucking with that history because that's my understanding of history as it happened, right? And that's what we are bringing. And any changes that happen to the to the blockchain are also recorded, right, in in the canonical ledger. So if you make a change to a contract, or if they make an upgrade to the contract and that contract changes, that is also logged as part of the transaction history. So you get the benefits of the immutable blockchain, but you provide the flexibility to to businesses and people that are writing smart contracts to be able to make those upgrades, to make those changes and version their contracts, right? And they can also govern that software through, um, you know, a really innovative account structure, right? So we built an account structure that allows for things like on-chain social recovery, right? Like you can, you can, you know, give three of your friends if they all sign a transaction together to help you recover your keys and you don't have to share any private That's keys, so cool. right? That's so and it's That's all so on chain, cool. right? Yeah. It's all on chain. It happens at layer one. And there's a lot of more interesting things you can do, right? And why did that come about? Well, I sat down with, you know, our software developers. And I'm like, I need to provide customer service. Like, what about this use case? I call my company and they're like, I need to recover my account. And it happens to be a blockchain-based service. How do they do that? So that's the solution. Can you explain it for in, in very briefly how you kind of saw it? Because that's been a, a problem for 10 years, you know? Yeah, exactly. So what we built inside the account structure is this notion of accounts can uh, have two types of permissions. Either they can manage other accounts within the account context, or they can perform uh, transactions, deploys, what we call deployments. So there's two, it's separation of concerns, right? And in any kind of access control list or permissioning scheme, you can either add users or you can do things, right? And so we modeled the exact same thing. Yeah. And then we have this notion of weights. So each, each account can be given a weight, and the weight is an arbitrary number. So for performing a transaction, you have a, what we call a threshold. So let's say, for example, um, you and Cliff, I want to provide you both access to uh, you know, manage oh, keys on so my cool. behalf. Oh, this is so cool. This is like employee consensus building. Yeah. Like, so, it, like it, if exactly. everyone has a good idea, they, build a con they all have different weights based on how good they are. Yep. This is so cool. Yeah, so that's exactly it. So let's say, for example, I um, I have a I I provide I give both of you access to my account, but you only each get a weight of one, right? Each of your keys get a weight of one. Anybody that needs to manage my keys has to have a minimum weight of two. And so what that means, neither of you can manage my keys by yourselves. You both have to sign together to add another key to my account or to help me recover my key. And this can grow arbitrarily, right? So you could have 10 people, 100 people, and you can set the weights to whatever because it's just a weight, right? So we haven't defined or limited how this works. And there's a lot of really interesting things you can do, right? You can build an, 
entire access structure for your for your contract. You can govern who can update your contract. You can govern who re, re, you know performs you can transactions. Build trust Anything. and off this too. It's not just with software. You can do like legal work. Yeah, it's on absolutely. the same type of account weighted structure. And I'm just thinking like how major, like you look at a company like VMware that's like deploying the same type of software, like you were talking about earlier in MP3, like constantly putting out a lot of, I'm just thinking as my friend, my friend works there and he talks to me about just managing developer teams Yep, that they're very political sometimes and then you deal with politics. But in this situation, developers in, internally can, can be assigned certain weighted numbers and then in order for like, let's just say you were the, the leader of that team, you can say in order for a piece of software to be brought to me for review, it needs to have a threshold of 80. So what's exactly. going to happen is all the developers are going to try to build consensus with each other. And they're not going to, it's so cool. I love shit yeah, like this. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So our, our design philosophy on the, like with respect to everything we're building around Casper is we believe the protocol should enable right? It should be an enabler of higher order functions, right? So we provide core capabilities at the protocol level, right? So the account you structure don't force provides it. core capability. Exactly. We don't force it. Like we don't block it in, right? So we built an account structure and with, with the weights and thresholds model, we provide core capabilities at the protocol level that enable developers to build features, right? And enables, and it's an enabler of higher order functions, but it isn't like you're not tightly locked in. Like we didn't really build features at the protocol level. We built capabilities. That's kind of like how we see building a protocol. This is what I expect from a protocol, right? When I'm building a platform, a platform is all about capabilities. It's not really about features. So this is why, so this is the thing. Everything you just described, both of you, it sounds great and it's amazing. And it's the future and what we've talked about. But there's one problem. It's expensive. And not expensive that it costs to build it, but it's expensive to use it because mm -hmm. if you want to have that security, you're gonna people are gonna need to pay for it. And it's a problem Bitcoin had a few years ago. It's a problem Ethereum's going through right now. Every kind I, I I executed three, I interacted with a contract today three times, each time cost me sixty dollars. Just wiped out my <laughs> profits, right? No point to so explain to me how you've and I and I tried to understand it, but essentially you're creating a gas futures market and, yep. and some space is blocked off. Why, why that approach? And then why do enterprises like that approach the best? Yeah. So one of the things we did is we reserve space. So we, we know that overwhelmingly the use case for blockchain is going to be token transfers. Like this is a big piece of what blockchain is going to be all about. Our blockchain is going to be the same thing, right? So we've got Turing complete contracts, which are, you know, web assembly deployments. And then we've got uh, token transfers. And what I, the edict I put forth to the team is like, hey, I want to make sure that a certain number of token transfers are guaranteed in each block, right? Because okay, we yeah. know that that's going to be overwhelmingly. So what we did is we literally cleaved away the block, cleaved, we, we kind of split up block space and reserved space in each block. So validators that are form, you know, following the protocol and want to propose valid blocks will have to follow that model. So what we're going to do is we're going to extend that model and we're going to enable contract authors to reserve future block space and will in essence basically tokenize that block space. So up to six months in advance, contract authors can predict and project how much block space they're going to need and they can purchase that block space in like advance. A hedge. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah. And you're, validators you're really applying... will be forced to follow this uh, gas futures market or they won't receive the transaction fees, right? And the proposer is the one that gets the fees. You're applying economic theory to you're applying economic theory, socioeconomic theory to, to th this software. In a way, it's like how what happened in Texas a few weeks ago where they were so cold and all the energy market was in flux and the energy's futures market got crazy and these companies were forced to buy energy at spot price. You kinda, and that's why a lot of people's electric bills went crazy high in Texas. So if you look at that and like the block size issue, and you kind of say, whoa, what if there was a way to like say, I may need some amount of block space in the future. Let's create a market for that, a futures market that I can uh, hedge. It's, it's pretty brilliant. So let me ask you a question. Do you see Bitcoin and Ethereum as that like blockchain 1.0? And then now all these next 
agnostic chains where they're not like token based, but they're more like these are variable based and we want to allow like amazing, we want to enable people to be able to not just build, but define what type of security they and speed they want where, where it's not affecting the chain. Is that the 2.0? And you could both kind of answer this. Is this at the 2.0? Will there be a 3.0 or is this kind of where blockchains are going? I absolutely like, you know, I believe in technology and innovation and I believe, I believe a lot of that's driven by what the market wants. And I think if we want to see a future where we're doing micro payments and, you know, using blockchain technology as like the base layer upon which, you know, all financial systems are built upon, then I think absolutely. Right. Um, we're ultimately held back by Silicon. I maintain like we've done fantastic work. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that, you know, blockchain is really dependent on the underlying networking layer, right? Whether you like to admit it or not, no matter how we dice it, at some point, even with these highly efficient proof of stake protocols, you have to collect and gather messages, right? You need, you need in order to form consensus, all those nodes have to agree on the, the global state, right? The high, transaction state. And that's messages. Node, yeah, asynchronization, and they need to be no latency and be able to communicate with each other. Exactly. In and real time, and yeah. while there's a lot of fiber optic networks, you still have this last mile problem, right? Sure. So you can have fiber up to the junction box, but then do you have fiber into the data center, right? And, and you could arguably say, yeah, I'm going to put all my nodes in really big data centers, but that's not really decentralized, <laughs> right? No, I mean, and you so have you ISPs want... are a problem too. Sure, no, sure. I see yeah. where your point is here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and we saw, uh, actually, I want, to, I want you to finish, Meta, when, when you get your thought out. But I did have a thought on the, you know, blockchain 1.0, 2.0. But yeah, please finish. Yeah. So anyway, so kind of bringing it back, I, I do see that um, you will need ultimately some kind of flexible finality, um, simply because transactions are different, right? Like buying a house is not the same as buying a cup of coffee, and if you we want it to be ubiquitous and forming the base layer for financial transactions, we're ultimately going to need that. So I can't see what the future holds, but I do feel very confident in the protocol that we've built. And I, I believe over time, it will continue to um, evolve and grow as the market uh, market needs uh, change. Yeah, and the, the, Charlie, the only other thing that I would add on, on your, you know, your framing of Bitcoin and Ethereum being 1.0 and, and the rest 2.0, um, I think doesn't give enough deference and respect to what Ethereum did. You know, I think, when you look at our industry, the two watershed moments are really the Satoshi white paper and the first Bitcoin transfer, you know, on January 1st, 2019, uh, sorry, 2009. Um, and then what Ethereum did was so revolutionary, you know, that that I almost say that's 2.0 because adding the smart contract capability and th that's what radically transformed the industry. And then, you know, what I think we're part of is maybe 3.0, however you, you slice it. But but this moment is now making blockchain accessible to industry, to government, to, to other sorts of groups and enterprises. And I think that's, you know, we'll see when we look back and do history, you know, maybe, you know, Casper and the Casper blockchain was the, the pivotal moment that it ushered in 3.0 because a lot of these next generation trains have been trying and we, we really hope that we are and, and we'll see very soon. Well, if you look at just the economic and political impact that you've solved here, like, just think of the, like, think of like, like uh, a, a government cabinet sitting in a room trying to like build consensus over a problem. You know, if, if, if somehow a lot of that was moved over to a Casper, like a CBC type of model where things were like weighted and you've removed share, the like shareholder proxy like, votes, right? Where person to go, like, I mean, you remove ma that massive international companies yeah. Yeah, all doing that. it all on chain where you can trust it and there's different weights to their keys like that. That's the kind of thing that, that we're talking about. You stopped having to trust the issuer of the technology, the technology itself. And from when the technology message, you, you guys say token transfers. I look at tokens as like just little packets of information. Right now, a lot of it's just money. So the, the difference, to token, what's the other, so what's the other type of transfer? You have like token transfers. And then contract execution deployment yeah, exactly. in interaction, right? Yep. That's exactly I think, right. So that type of stuff is, so you look at, I look at like contract and I look at 
interacting with the blockchain is like in the modern day world is if you were like dealing with civil your 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 government or you're dealing with uh, any issue that you have like the Estonian government like you log on and you have to deal with their government somehow paying your your taxes your property taxes your utility bill or whatever but then I look at tokens cho- token transfers as little packets of information that's moving from one person to another and while now it's 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 uh it's finance could be anything could be data but you don't have to interact with that main chain you can go from one person to another and that's why I agree with down the road that we're getting into that next level into that next wave of like what can these blockchains really 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 do like what what do you want what do you guys want to see blockchains do like down the road like if you're if you're back and you're sitting on your veranda one day you're in your rocking chair and you're like oh remember when we got blockchains uh, to do I don't this, actually you know? see it like like that I see how can the use of blockchain technology when a corporation or a government incorporates it makes what they're doing better and so you you might not you you might know not know that it's blockchain but maybe one day uh you know if you go to a casino and someone instead of taking a bunch of cash and whatnot you're you have like a a mgm stable coin or some sort of thing and 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 all of that is happening powered by blockchain technology where you can trust that that it all works that's the kind of stuff that i'm excited for about where blockchains in the background and we can all just function knowing more securely that uh you know that that the information is being stored and processed we can all be sure it's going to happen in a way where we're safe as individual users and the, and the system knows that it's working faster or or more securely uh it's it's the real world changes with blockchain in the background that i'm excited about i love it i love it what about you meta i mean for me um, if I'm sitting in my rocking chair and thinking about, man, you know, uh, the real vision of blockchain uh, coming to bear, it's about um, shifting the paradigm where people have uh, real stores of value to preserve their wealth, number one. Um, you know, stepping away from this notion of use universal basic income for the rich. From this perspective, I'm very much a I don't know if I want to call it a libertarian at heart, but I believe that uh, every person should have equal opportunity to, you know, procure and, and, you know, save their money so they can have a great rainy day fund. Um, even if they don't necessarily, if they, even if they only transact in cash, right. If they transact only in crypto, that that crypto holds its value um, in a much more harder form of money. Um, I also see, uh, you know, future facing a new category of transactions that are consumer to consumer. Right. Like you we, traditionally we have a B2B and B2C, but I suspect that, you know, it would be really, really cool to have, you know, farmers markets where I can sell my own oranges to my neighbor if I have a, a bounty crop or whatever it could be. Right. So an extension of the Air B2B and the Uber oh, economies without Air B2B and Uber. Right. So now you have consumers connecting with consumers using the trust of the blockchain layer. Right. So for me, that's the that's the future that I would like to see. And I think it's coming. I think we still need um, a lot more scalability in the underlying silicon yeah. for accessibility, but I think we'll get there. I think it'll take some time, but I think I'll probably be in a rocking chair by then. <laughs> but yeah. I'll take it. I think we'll all be there. And and I, I, I think I would love, to, my answer would be honestly both, both of yours. Like, cause Meta, you described like a, a, uh, more of like a, a larger macro interaction and cliff you described like like you said like just i go to the casino all the time and it would be great to have not to remove that trust but like to take it a step further you know how easy would it be oh, i don't want to go but like it just would make life easier yeah if everyone has always said that if everything was was done in like a centralized way it would be easier i heard on the radio the other day and I, and I heard someone say, like, how easy would have COVID been or vaccinations been or everything if it was all one central medical database? And I turned off the radio and said to myself, you know, the human wanting for that is is real. And I understand why, because we all were a collective humans. We all if an asteroid's coming to Earth, we're going to band together to save us. We're a collective. We're humans. But at the end of the day, we all like our individuality. So it's like, how do you? It, it, if, if, if I can add two. to that, Charlie, so want, yeah, because I, I think the, this industry attracts a lot of people like super liberals that, that want to make sure there's equality in the world for those that 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 don't have it, but also super libertarians that, that want empowerment. And yes. I think blockchain provides that. Right. It's it's both equitizing and and empowering. It's bipartisan, and, and, you know, and thinking back, like what was 
one of the moments that really like helped me slip down the rabbit hole was was the uh, Equifax data breach. I think it was September of 2017. Like regardless of oh, your yeah, political stripes, that. you know, no one wants a third of all Americans' data to be out there in the black market, right? And and that's the kind of those are the kind of things that I see this industry helping to evolve society. Let's put that on chain, and we can all just be fully confident that our data is safe. I love it. Thank you guys so much for taking the time and coming on Untold Stories today. We dove deep into some uh, very interesting subjects and really got, I think, got a, a handle on why what you're doing is not only important for the crypto community, but for the world at large and, and all of humanity. So thank you for for working on that, for doing the the research and development on something that took years to to give you that like personal satisfaction to now finally see going into the public eye. Thank you guys again and to all the listeners, thank you guys for listening to Untold Stories and I'm your host Charlie Shrem and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye everyone, thanks Charlie. Bye everyone, thanks for having us on.